In 2013, a killing spree would unfold in California. Officer shot multiple times. That would grip the United States. Deputies say the killer could be anywhere. And grab headlines across the globe. The man who did this was a monster. Targeting his former employers at the LAPD. He was willing to do anything to kill police officers and their families and to get away. Ex-cop Christopher Dorner would embark on a vigilante mission for vengeance. He held a pistol out the window and fired multiple shots. As the clock ticked, the body count rose. The truck had a window down, assault rifle out of it, and started shooting. Another officer down. And with it, the question, what could have provoked Christopher Dorner to commit his killing spree? He was going to get even through the barrel of a gun. Surrounded by the vast wilderness of the San Bernardino National Forest, the tranquil mountain town of Big Bear is one of Southern California's most popular tourist destinations. Big Bear is a great little mountain town. Big Bear and its environs, its neighbors, are a huge pine forest, essentially. We're out in the wilderness, kind of, you know? I mean, the, the, so that's what, that's what people like here. Yet on February the 12th, 2013, at the height of the normally bustling ski season, the atmosphere and peace of this picturesque resort was shattered. A manhunt underway right now for a former Los Angeles police officer accused of murdering three people. Law enforcement authorities from across the state had descended on the tranquil area as they sought a spree killer on the run. We were all on edge, you know, we're all keeping weapons by the door. People were taking uh, precautions. The lone gunman had left a trail of carnage across California's cityscape before hiding out in the mountains. Christopher Dorner was now the most wanted man in America. There is a possibility that he's out here, and that's why we're out here searching. The search involved every level of law enforcement in the United States. I would say thousands of police officers were involved. You know, this was one of the largest uh, deployments of policing agencies in my memory. The threat posed by Dorna was palpable. Any police officer that tried to arrest him or contact him would be a target. And apprehending him would be a challenge for detectives that had little precedent. Mr. Dorner's uh, military training, his police training, the type and nature of weapons that we knew that he had in his possession heightened uh, our concerns. We didn't get much sleep during that period of time. After several days spent scouring the mountains, it was believed that the elusive killer may have slipped the net. He went to ground. Didn't leave any, heat, what we'd call a heat signature. You, you couldn't find him. However, in the early afternoon of the 12th of February, Dorna broke cover and was reported to police, sparking fresh life into the sprawling search efforts. Down the mountain. We heard the broadcast over the radio that Dorner had been sighted. Threw our raid vests on and we just headed out. We knew that he had already killed multiple people. The first thing that was going through my mind is if we do find him, we were going to be involved in a shooting with him. Dorner was not rational. He was unpredictable, willing to do anything to get away. There was no question, at least in my mind, that this was going to end in more killing.
Local scout camp leader Rick Helterbreak was on the mountain that day, unaware of the drama that was beginning to unfold. I came down the road, I'm just checking the perimeter as I call it. All this right as you see is all my property, all this stuff. So I'm checking to make sure nobody's down here, no snow players, no vehicles, basically just doing a security check. So I'm driving up here, just minding my own business, a day like any other day. Roughly about in here someplace, I see movement up here on the left. I don't know what it is. And right about in here, I see a crashed car. At around 12.45 p.m., Rick would lay eyes on the man who was the subject of one of the nation's largest ever manhunts. Within a split second or so, seemingly, I came up and Christopher Dorner came out of the snowbank at me with a rifle pointed at me. In 1979, 34 years prior to his ruthless spree, Christopher Dorner and his family moved from New York to the middle-class neighborhood of Norwalk in Southern California. He was raised in a middle-income society, not a ghetto. Um, his family wasn't tremendously poor. Despite his tranquil suburban surroundings, from an early age, Dorner would develop the sense that the world was against him. I remember him telling me that he was the only African-American uh, child in his class or, or in his neighborhood. He would regularly get beat up after school. Uh, there were you know, other bullies in the neighborhood who would give him a hard time. To hear him tell it, it was racially motivated. At college, friends recall Dorna as outgoing and well-educated. I met Chris Dorner in college. He and I played football together. He was clean cut, articulate, pretty easy to get along with. Um, he was approachable, good sense of humor. Um, you know, he wasn't somebody who was serious all the time. He'd laugh and smile and, you know, was no, you know, normal. I mean, he was normal 19-year-old, 20-year-old guy. However, Dorna's habit of painting himself as a victim of prejudice would continue. He was very conscious of how people treated him. I don't think that he was all that thrilled about our coaches uh, on the football team. He commented to me that he thought that particular coach was racist. Dorna's problems with authority would continue after college. Having spent time enlisted in the Navy Reserves, his tendency to blame others was again noted when he joined the LAPD. In his short time at the LAPD, uh, Christopher Dorner uh, was the center of a, of a lot of controversy. Uh, he made uh, several complaints against other officers. He saw everything that happened to him that wasn't to his liking as a consequence of his race or of some overall scheme against him. He was a troubled man. Christopher Dorner's festering resentment would eventually overwhelm him and extreme violence would be the tragic consequence. In 2013, Christopher Dorner would perpetrate a killing spree that would leave California paralyzed by fear. Law enforcement throughout Southern California is heightened and aware and concerned and scared because any one of them could have been his next target. The former LAPD man would turn fugitive and orchestrate a campaign of murder that would draw international attention and spark a massive manhunt. I think at one point in time, the, the, the rewards throughout Southern California for his apprehension um, amounted to over a million and a half dollars. The extraordinary spree would begin in puzzling circumstances. The 3rd of February, 2013, 7.30 p.m. The city of Irvine, 40 miles southeast of Los Angeles. 
27-year-old Monica Kwan and her fiancé Keith Lawrence were found slain in the parking lot at their apartment building. She was a uh, coach in, in the school system and a, a very well uh, respected uh, individual in the community. Uh, she was engaged to Keith Lawrence. The man who did this was a monster. Initially, the motivation for this predatory crime seemed difficult to determine. Irvine Police Department were uh, stunned by the randomness of the selection of victims in this crime. They are uh, young people uh, with uh, no enemies, no connection to crime, no history of violence. And so detectives were, were at a loss. With police on tactical alert across this region tonight, men and women in uniform as well as the community are remembering Monica Kwan, a heartbreaking day as police search for a killer. However, in the early hours of the 4th of February, Christopher Dorner would not only claim responsibility for the killings, but announce his plans to continue his spree by targeting police officers. Holed up in an unassuming motel, Dorner posted a multi-page manifesto online. Upon discovery of the sprawling document, police began their investigation. Today, we have identified Christopher Jordan Dorner as a suspect in this double homicide. The manifesto outlined Dorner's motives. In this rambling manifesto posted on Dorner's Facebook page, he details everything. And made clear his grievances with the LAPD. Christopher Dorner had a troubled history with the Los Angeles Police Department. On his probationary period, his training officer uh, counseled him about his performance. Uh, soon after that, he made allegations uh, of excessive force against her uh, during an arrest. Uh, those allegations were not supported by witnesses or fact. And because of that, uh, Dorner charges were soon applied against Dorner, and he was terminated from the Los Angeles Police Department for being untruthful. He felt that um, because of his race in law enforcement, that that affected his uh, professional career in a detrimental way. He was an injustice collector. He was a person that believed that, that nothing that ever happened to him was as a result of his own doing. The worst thing about these setbacks for him were, because he was a narcissist, it was stripping him of everything that he held true. His identity, his service record. You take that away from a narcissist, the outer trappings of success, then there's nothing left for him to have. Vengeance is a very powerful motivation in spree killing. We see their victims, they see villains. And so they want to get even uh, through the barrel of a gun. Further reading of the sprawling document would uncover Dorna's twisted logic behind classifying Monica Kwan as a legitimate target for his vengeance. Monica Kwan is the daughter of uh, Randy Kwan, an LAPD captain, the individual who had represented him, not prosecuted him, represented him at his administrative hearing during which he was terminated, fired from the Los Angeles Police Department. Dorner decided to pick them as his avenue for revenge. The circumstances of the young couple's deaths would give investigators a chilling insight into the cold-blooded mind of Christopher Dorner. It appears that it was an ambush. Multiple rounds were fired. Uh, I doubt that either of them had any time to know what or who was happening. They were caught very off guard and basically slaughtered, executed. The victims had no opportunity to escape or respond, uh, that it was calculated. This was a crime of uh, great brutality. He claimed he was not done um, and that he was still going to uh, go after other law enforcement officers. The unique threat posed by Dorna's military training and knowledge of police tactics had officers on edge. When Christopher Dorner went on his rampage, every law enforcement agency around was aware of him. We were all on high alert. 
He had, you know, specialized training with, with weapons. He's aware of um, law enforcement's routines. As the investigation continued, CCTV footage emerged of Dorna dumping weapons in the aftermath of the Kwan and Lawrence murders. Staying one step ahead of the police, Dorna turned the tables on his pursuers, and the hunters would now become the hunted. The 7th of February, 2013, 1.45 a.m. Riverside City, California. Cab driver Karam Kayoud was working the night shift. Normal evening was not that busy, just, just normal. I'm at the stop sign, like a uh, gray to blue truck. This guy, he, he ran the red light. At the same moment when I was thinking about this, I saw the police officer. I saw a truck pulling up next to the police. There is a car between them. In that car was Jack Chilson, a local resident who was also in the area. And that particular night when I was going my way home, I was at a red light, and when I looked to my right, there was a police officer that pulled up in a squad car. Riverside officers Michael Crane and Andrew Takayas were out working a routine late night patrol. Mike Crane was uh, a remarkable police officer. He had uh, about 11 years of service. In his personal life, he was the father of two children. Andy Takayas uh, was a new officer to the Riverside Police Department. Karam, Jack, and officers Crane and Takayas were about to become embroiled in the burgeoning spree. The officers and I were looking at each other, and then I seen something on peripheral vision on my left-hand side, and I seen a large black male in a truck with a, an assault rifle at his driver's window, resting on the window, and he started shooting. But I'm looking to my left, watching him shooting across my hood into the uh, driver's window, side window of the police officer's squad car. Opening fire on Crane and Takayas, Dorna would not discriminate when it came to dispatching violence. He had safety goggles on and he had a grin on his face. It was like he was happy. He didn't feel sorry or anything. First of all, it's not believing what's happening. I couldn't believe it. The driver slumped forward, that's all I seen. I never seen the passenger. After he shot in, uh, the police officers, he just left, he didn't peel out, he just, like, nothing ever happened. No speeding, no nothing, like, he took, you know, like he was going home. No emotion. With the officers helpless, their patrol car strafed with bullets, taxi driver Karam came to their aid. My feeling was, it's, you, at that moment, you don't have those feelings, you just act. I left my car and went to them. I saw the passenger police officer sitting up and Officer Taki, the wounded one, he barely like can move. And I told him, what should I do? What should I do? So he told me the radio, the radio. So I pull it up and press the button and grab it to his mouth and he start to call. Officer shot multiple times. He cannot, he cannot move, he cannot even grab the radio. He was wounded so bad. When police support arrived on the scene of the shooting, it proved to be too late for Michael Crane. Two police officers went to his window and uh, touched his neck, I believe, and they made their head like this, that he's, he's dead. As the spree now entered its fourth day, Officer Andrew Takayas had been left critically wounded. Following the death of Michael Crane, Christopher Dorner's victims now numbered three. It's very sad, actually. It's very sad, especially you have, like, two kids. 
and a wife. His attack on Officer Takius and, and Officer Crane uh, was cowardice. It was a blind side. It was suppressed fire. Uh, they had no idea he was even in the area. To be murdered for what you do for a living is the height of prejudice. Here's a man who reviled against prejudice in his manifesto. Yet he wasn't willing to kill somebody just because of what they were wearing that day, just because they were a law enforcement officer. Only hours on from the murder of Michael Crane, Christopher Dorner's spree was to hit the skids, and detectives would soon have him in their sights. We had a full perimeter around the cabin, constant exchange of gunfire, I mean hundreds and hundreds of rounds being shot back and forth. He was like a trapped animal at that point. He was prepared for it and more than willing to, to fight. In 2013, California would be struck by a killing spree that would make waves around the world. I think during that week to 10 day period of time, I would say thousands of police officers were involved. Making his violent intentions public via an online manifesto, Christopher Dorner announced plans to target his former employers at the LAPD. He was gonna seek revenge and we seek revenge in a very violent way. Four days into his spree, Dorna had claimed the lives of three. They made their head like this, that he's dead. Leaving another critically injured. His indiscriminate killings initiating a statewide climate of fear. There wasn't much rationality that you could attribute to this individual that you could say, okay, we know who's safe and who's not safe. So a very much heightened sense of danger and vulnerability with police paranoia at an all-time high, they at last got a break in the case. In a remote area um, on, a, on a dirt road, uh, his burned out truck was found. When Christopher Dorner crashed his truck up in the mountain, I think the majority of us believed he was still up there. There was an initial concern that this was bait and that Dorner was somewhere nearby ready to, to uh, snipe. People were worried. Nobody knew where he was. We were all on edge. You know, we're all keeping weapons by the door. Hopefully not that we're going to confront somebody like Christopher Dorner. The discovery was made on the edge of the mountain town of Big Bear and would mark a turning point in what had now become one of the largest manhunts in Californian history. During the actual manhunt right after Christopher Dorner's vehicle was found, there were hundreds of officers up there. All the police agencies in my county were on tactical alert, the Sheriff's Department, the Riverside Police Department. The, the search involved every level of law enforcement in the United States. With Dorner's reputation for the unpredictable in mind, police proceeded with caution as they began their investigation. He was well armed. He had access to assault weapons, uh, and extremely high powered assault weapons at that. Uh, he had a uh, large quantity of ammunition. He was very mobile. With the normally tranquil ski resort now overrun with detectives, the search for Dorna began. We're at using uh, snowcats and APCs with chains on them to get to those areas. Deputies say they searched 200 homes in an eight mile wooded area where Christopher Dorner's burnt out truck was discovered. Knocking on doors, going through fields and forests, um, trying to see if they could locate him or find him. You're talking about thousands of cabins in isolated areas. And as many as they searched out there, he had the advantage, no question. 
You could easily find an unoccupied cabin and maybe break in and, and stay there. The challenges of tracking Dorna down in such hostile terrain would be considerable. Just the element of surprise that he actually had the benefit of. When you don't know where somebody is hiding, it gives them an extreme advantage. You didn't know if he was hiding behind a tree with a sniper's rifle. They were trudging around trying to uh, locate him, and he could be behind any tree or any corner waiting to shoot them and kill them. As the story began to break worldwide, observers started to examine what might be driving Dorna to commit his crimes. You, know, you have to sit there and, and really think hard, is this the guy that I knew or was the guy that I knew a facade? I mean, was he, you know, pulled one over on me all those years? To see somebody go from being a bright, capable young man with a bright future to America's most wanted, um, you know, mass murderer. I was flabbergasted. I think what Mr. Dorner ultimately realized was that in a sense his world was crumbling around him. Everything that he had tried to accomplish and set out as goals, whether it be in the military or in law enforcement, didn't end well for him. He was a failure and he couldn't deal with that. He couldn't accept that um, and he had nowhere else to go and ultimately uh, wrought retribution. In the years that followed his dismissal from the LAPD, Dorna would suffer further personal setbacks, resulting in a steady slide into depression. Being depressed, as Dorna suggested, is not the sole reason why individuals engage in spree killings. No doubt he was depressed. What Dorna had that was different to the millions of other people who become severely depressed is he had narcissistic tendencies, he had access to firearms, and he also had a willingness to kill to prove his point. With his life at its lowest ever ebb, Dorna began to ready himself for what he called his last resort. After he was dismissed from the police department, he was apparently buying and selling guns and suppressors and ammunition, and the whole time stewing about what had happened to him. Following the killings in Irvine and Riverside, Dorna had fled to the mountains of Southern California. Search parties continued to scour Big Bear for any sign of the fugitive killer. However, their progress was slowed by hostile weather conditions. The SWAT team and more than 120 heavily armed officers have been combing the area for two days. The snow slowing but not stopping their search. Locals and authorities alike feared Christopher Dorna may have slipped the net. Other than his burned out vehicle, um, we had no specific information that he was still in the Big Bear area. The longer the time passed, more and more people were thinking that he was gone. However, such feelings would prove unfounded. The 12th of February, 2013, 12.22 p.m. Mountain Vista Resort, Big Bear. 911 received a call from holiday cabin owner Karen Reynolds. 911 emergency, what are you reporting? I got my warning. You guys were tied up? Yeah, I got killed. He went into a cabin where a couple were arrived, I guess, after he had uh, broken into that cabin, and he held them, tied them up and held them captive. The victims are managed to free themselves. They call the authorities and they report that he has taken their car. What's the make and model? It's a Nissan Rogue, R-O-G-U-E. Those people are very fortunate that they are still alive. With fresh information to hand, officers Jim Simons and Mike Medici now had a hot lead on a trail they feared had gone cold. Suspect left 15 to 30 ago and took keys to Nissan Rogue. Our mission was to find Dorner. 
was to find the car he was driving, was to try to outthink him where he was going next. Locked out the mountain. Christopher Dorner made it very clear that we law enforcement officers were his targets. So yeah, it obviously heightened our awareness. While officers Simons and Medici continued to pursue Dorner, unsuspecting local resident Rick Helterbrake would be confronted by the most wanted man in America. Right about in here, I see a crashed car, and then I see Dorner coming out of the snowbank right there, right at me. I remember him coming at me. I remember the vest. He had a big ballistics vest on with pockets in it. He's got a gun right at my head. I could tell it was some kind of assault rifle. I go like this, put my truck in park. He says, I don't want to hurt you. Just get out and start walking. I had that sense that I wasn't one of his targets. You know, he wanted to kill cops, and I wasn't a cop. I left the, the truck roughly in this position right here. I got up, and I started walking up the road. You realize you just got confronted by the most wanted man in America, and um, you know, he let me go. After Rick alerted authorities to his encounter with Dorna. Be a white Dodge pickup truck headed down down Flash Road. The pursuit would hurtle towards its explosive end. All double units to Glass Road in 38. The terrain out there was wide open, nothing but trees and snow. Um, you talk about rubbernecking, we had to look in a, in a swivel for him because you didn't know what tree he was behind, what set of rocks he might be behind. We knew he was, uh, he was not gonna go easy. We knew it was probably going to end up in some type of uh, confrontation involving gunfire. San Bernardino Sheriff's deputies Alex Collins and Jeremiah McKay also joined the chase. Jeremiah was very familiar uh, with the Big Bear area. He had been stationed up there um, as a deputy with the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department. So he was hot on Mr. Dorner's trail. Are we sure he's in the vehicle? And what tracks are we following, vehicle or foot? The radio traffic told us to go a, a direction which was a right turn for us. Um, Jeremiah went left, and we did make that right turn according to the radio. We got to the intersection, and that's when we started hearing the gunfire. Shots fired, shots fired. Seven Oaks Cabin, Seven Oaks Cabin. Probably shots fired, Seven Oaks Cabin. As shots began to ring out, deputies Collins and McKay found themselves in the line of fire. Returning fire. Are they returning fire? The officer down, officer down. Are the officer down? Alex Collins had taken a shot to the face and another three to his chest, arm and leg. Dorna's crosshairs would then fall on Jeremiah McKay. We turned around, we pulled up and saw Jeremiah on the ground. One, four, five, another officer down. Copy, another officer down. I saw that Jeremiah McKay was down and he wasn't moving. It, it appeared that he was, he, he was dead. Christopher Dorner had claimed another life and had left another officer seriously wounded. Staging his last stand, Dorner barricaded himself into an uninhabited cabin, taking aim at anyone in his sights. Fire, automatic fire coming inbound. Mike Medici and Jim Simons would return fire. Dorner started shooting at the, the deputies pinned down behind their vehicle. Automatic fire inbound. So we immediately just started shooting at Christopher Dorner in the cabin, trying to get him to stop firing. All you would hear are thuds, basically, coming over your head. There was no question in my mind he was not going to just 
give up or stop. SWAT is on scene. More teams of officers responded. Constant exchange of gunfire. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of rounds being shot back and forth. Deputies are still down in the kill zone. And he would start shooting at the, the deputies pinned behind the car again. We can hear the rounds, you know, hitting their car. They are popping off smoke to get the wounded deputies out. Under the cover of smoke, officers Collins and McKay were retrieved from the kill zone. Deputy Collins would receive treatment for his injuries. As the gun battle raged, officers moved in to pin down the man they had been hunting for. The San Bernardino SWAT team started making a tactical plan. 4.5, we need the armored vehicle. 4.5, copy, we need the armored vehicle. At 4.15 p.m., more than two hours into the cabin siege and nine days since the spree began, Dorna's last chance of escape was about to go up in smoke. In 2013, Christopher Dorner would embark on a killing spree, declaring his intent to dispatch vigilante justice against his former employers at the LAPD. He was a ghost. You never knew where he was or firing from. The out-of-control ex-cop would take the lives of four in nine days, leaving two other victims critically wounded. Sought by law enforcement authorities from across California, Dorna would stage his last stand in a remote mountain cabin near the tourist town of Big Bear. There was no question in my mind he was not going to just give up or stop. The officer down, officer down. Even with the cabin surrounded and the odds stacked against him, Dorna seemed determined to continue his fight until the last. They made announcements to come out and give yourself up um, numerous times. Periodically, the gunfire from inside the cabin continued. At that point, it was very obvious he had no intentions of giving up at all. Having refused all negotiations for over two hours, at 4.15 p.m., SWAT teams would execute a plan designed to smoke Dorna out deploying potent tear gas canisters, known as burners, into the cabin. Control 61 Lincoln, we're gonna be deploying a gas burner. Ultimately, the Sheriff's Department end up throwing in a smoke canister, you know, which it kind of explodes and expels the gas with a flame. We have a fire. Unfortunately, that started a fire inside the cabin. The whole time, we, we never got any communication back from Christopher Dorner in any way, no intentions of turning himself in or giving himself up. Okay, guys, be ready on the number four side. We have fire in the front. It might come out the back. Watching events unfold live on TV, Dorner's former friend, James Usera, felt mixed emotions. It was bizarre to sit there watching the TV screen. The cabin was on fire. One side fully engulfed, fire on the fourth. That was the moment where I kind of knew that, okay, my friend's gonna die, and there's nothing, there's nothing anybody can do about it. He ain't coming out of that alive. Shortly after the cabin became engulfed by flames, a single sound emerged from the hut. It sounded like one shot fired from inside the residence. That signaled the end of nine days that would rank as some of the most chaotic in California's recent history. Copy, one shot fired from inside the residence. We heard a single gunshot, which we believed was um, Christopher Dorner uh, committing suicide, taking his own life. Even in uh, death, you know, he denied reality. I think he took the cowardly way out. He was man enough to take the lives of several people, but he was not man enough to do the time for it. 
He chose the narcissist's way out by ending his own life. Making the final decision over life and death, he chose to control what happened to him, not the police. For detectives and citizens alike, the end of Dorna's spree offered a chance to reflect on the events of the previous nine days. The sense of relief was nobody else is going to die today. I was very relieved that we had finally put an end to this madness that he had created. He was an evil man. He came to an evil end, and uh, the world's better for it. As the smoke from the smoldering cabin began to clear, Thoughts turned towards what could have been behind Dorna's decision to conduct his killing spree. Chris was a very capable young man. He, he could have done anything. I mean, he was smart, he was educated. So to see it end the way that it did, you know, we're all left asking questions about what, what was the catalyst, you know, what made him snap. Dorna was in his 30s at the time. This is a time in many men's lives when they feel they should be reaching the pinnacle of success. And instead, Dorner was sliding downhill fast. And it's that lack of success that made him believe that there was little hope for the future and he was going to get even through the barrel of a gun. He's taken on this anger and fury and personalized it. And at that point, he starts to lose sense of reality and focus more on this idea of gaining revenge. It's not something I ever would have expected, but I mean, do you, can you honestly say that there's anybody you've ever met who you would expect would be a killer someday? I mean, you just, nobody expects that of other people. Like many other grudge-based spree killers, Dorner is clearly laying the blame at the feet of his victims. He's prepared to murder a number of individuals and see it as being a justifiable crime. This forms part of his narcissistic personality. He's more keen on getting his version of events across than any remorse he may feel for the victims. Without the bravery displayed by officers in the line of duty, the ultimate outcome of Dorna's spree may have been far graver. Law enforcement is full of heroes. Um, the, the men and women of all of the agencies that participated in the manhunt for Dorna uh, acted as heroes. And every one of them faced danger every time they put on this uniform or one like it and went out into public. And they know it. What is beyond doubt is that the loss of innocent life suffered at Dorna's hand over those nine days was senseless. You know, Dorner never killed anybody that knew him or anybody that had any direct connection with all the things that, that he thought had been done wrong to him. Uh, all of his four victims were completely innocent. It's obviously an extreme shock to all the police officers when we do lose a, a, a colleague. I think it kind of brings us together closer. I think it increases our camaraderie um, because we realize that, you know, at any time one of us can be shot and killed. I went to Deputy McKay's uh, funeral service. I ran into uh, an old friend of mine that I hadn't seen for probably 15 or 20 years. And I was just talking with him at the funeral and then he told me that his daughter was Deputy McKay's wife. And at that moment, I started, he and I started crying. It's, it's a very tragic situation. 